A remarkable scientific discovery has been made in China. Researchers say they found the skull of what they believe is a new species of human, which could be our closest evolutionary relative. Again, the history of our species has been rewritten. Picture yourself at a popular destination in any of the world's metropolises. A Nigerian family, a Chinese couple, a German school party, and more people from other countries are there. They all have quite diverse appearances from one another, which is not surprising considering that their ancestors have spent generations residing in remote regions of the Earth. Then yet, everyone alive today can be traced back to Africa, so surely there was a time before such physical disparities existed. No, actually. In reality, if you could time travel to the dawn of humanity and pick any random group of humans, they would look nothing like the people of Africa or anywhere else in the world today. The theory that humans originated from a single group of people who lived in Africa hundreds of thousands of years ago has been disproved by a recent study that combines archaeology, anthropology, and genealogy. How come we used to be so much more similar? How did we mistakenly come to believe that all humans descended from a primitive group in East Africa? Let's find out. We had far wilder and more colorful beginnings. The protracted process of change that separated humans from their ape-like forebears is known as human evolution. According to scientific research, the physical characteristics and behavioral features that all humans share have their roots in ape-like ancestors and have been evolving for almost six million years. Bipedalism, or the capacity to walk on two legs, originated more than four million years ago and is one of the early characteristics that distinguish humans. Other crucial human traits, such as a large and complex brain, the capacity for language, and the ability to create and utilize tools emerged relatively recently. The previous 100,000 years have seen the emergence of many advanced qualities such as complex symbolic expression, art, and rich cultural diversity. Scientists agree that there were between 15 and 20 distinct early human species. However, not all scientists agree on the relationships between these species or which ones went extinct. Most, if not all, of the first human species vanished without a trace. As for the elements that drove the evolution and demise of the many hominin species, scientists can't seem to agree on how to name and classify them. You, along with every other human being alive today, are members of the Homo sapiens species. Homo sapiens emerged in Africa 300,000 years ago during a period of extreme climatic change. They hunted and foraged for food, and they developed skills that helped them deal with the difficulties of surviving in unsteady surroundings, just like other early people who lived in this period. Additionally, they exhibit tremendous physical variety that far exceeds that of groups of modern humans. Homo sapiens are more homogeneous today than our ancestors were, not more diversified since we have adapted to live in various parts of the Earth. A series of extraordinary discoveries with far-reaching consequences for our origins have been made in recent years. This is a true mystery. It simply contradicts the widely held belief that we descended from a single group in a remote region of East Africa. Anatomically, modern people can be distinguished from older humans by the lighter build of their skeletons. The average size of the very big brain seen in modern humans, which range in size from population to population and between males and females, is about 1300 cubic centimeters. The restructuring of the skull into what is considered to be modern, a thin-walled, high-vaulted skull with a flat and nearly vertical forehead, was necessary to house this large brain. The heavy brow ridges and prognathism of other early humans are similarly much less noticeable on modern human faces, if at all. Our teeth are smaller and our jaws are less fully developed. The term anatomically modern Homo sapiens is frequently used by scientists to describe members of our own species who lived in the distant past. Homo sapiens does not have a true type specimen, in contrast to every other human species. In other words, no specific Homo sapiens person is recognized by scientists as the specimen that gave Homo sapiens its name. Despite the fact that Linnaeus initially identified our species in 1758, type specimen designation was not common at the time. The Edward Drinker Cope skull is said to have been designated as the lectotype, essentially the type specimen, by paleontologist Robert Backer in 1994. When Cope, a renowned paleontologist himself, passed away in 1897, he left his remains to science. 
The University of Pennsylvania now holds them. However, a type specimen is one that has been inspected by the person who first described a species, so Cope's remains do not meet this requirement. What allowed them to live? In addition to creating and using stone tools, prehistoric Homo sapiens also polished and specialized them, creating a variety of smaller, more intricate, and specialized tools such composite stone tools, fish hooks and harpoons, bows and arrows, spear throwers, and sewing needles. All humans, ancient and modern, have had to find their own food for millions of years. They spent a significant portion of each day picking vegetation and engaging in animal hunting or scavenging. Modern people began collecting and cooking shellfish 164,000 years ago, and by 90,000 years ago, they had started creating specialized fishing gear. Then, within the last 12,000 years, our species, Homo sapiens, transitioned to food production and environmental alteration. Humans discovered they could manage the development and reproduction of some plants and animals. This finding paved the way for farming and animal herding, two occupations that changed the natural landscapes of Earth, first locally and later internationally. Humans began to settle down as they put more effort into growing food. Towns grew out of villages, while cities grew out of towns. The human population started to rise dramatically as more food became available. Our species has become so prosperous that it unintentionally brought about a turning point in the evolution of life on Earth. Many of the physical and behavioral traits that modern humans have evolved share some similarities with other early human species, though not to the same extent. Modern humans were able to connect with their environment and one another in novel and unusual ways thanks to their complex minds. Our predecessors were better able to survive as the environment got more unpredictable thanks to larger brains. They ate a variety of animal and plant foods. They controlled fire, they lived in shelters, they built large social networks, sometimes involving people they have never even met. They traded resources over vast distances, and they produced art, music, personal adornment, rituals, and a complex symbolic world. The population of modern humans has greatly increased and spread to every continent. They have changed the world in ways that are very advantageous to them. However, this metamorphosis has unforeseen effects on both other species and ourselves, posing new threats to our ability to survive. The more than 200 species that make up the order of primates include humans, according to fossils and DNA. Humans are nested inside the big ape family within that larger group. Despite not deriving from any of the current apes, chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans, the great apes, as well as other primates share traits with us. We most likely descended from Homo heidelbergensis, the progenitor that Neanderthals, our closest extinct kin, also share with us. Our own species is something we don't fully understand, but we're constantly learning more. Our understanding of who we are continues to grow as a result of research on fossils, genetics, behavior, and biology of contemporary humans. Who was the progenitor we descended from directly? Was it a different species or Homo heidelbergensis, as many paleoanthropologists believe? How much hybridization has taken place between Homo neanderthalensis and our species? Our species has a long-standing origin myth, according to which we descended from a tribe of hominids that lived in Africa some 200,000 years ago. Some scientists believe that origin originated in East Africa, while others favor a birthplace in the South. In any scenario, the story always starts at the same place. Homo heidelbergensis, our ancestors, undoubtedly steadily gathered the traits that make up our species, including the rounded skull, tiny face, prominent chin, complex tools, and sophisticated culture. We gradually expanded over Africa and the rest of the world from that early cradle. But other scientists are now claiming that the geography, linearity, and simplicity of this textbook account are incorrect. Yes, humans did originate from African hominids, but it was a complex process that involved the entire continent. Consider the recently discovered ancient human remains from the Jebel Irhud cave in Morocco. The earliest known fossils of Homo sapiens are these bones, which date back 315,000 years. In addition to delaying the anticipated emergence of our species, they also expanded the list of potential origin regions to include Northwest Africa. They also possessed an unusual fusion of traits, including the elongated heads of extinct species like Homo erectus and the flat faces of modern humans. They could have been mistaken for us from the front, 
but they would have been obvious from the side. The 260-000 year-old Florisbad skull from South Africa, the 195-000 year-old Omokibish bones, and the 160-000 year-old Herto skull, both from Ethiopia, are examples of fossils from all across Africa that combine modern and ancient features in interesting ways. Some researchers contend that these remains belong to a separate subspecies of Homo sapiens, if not an entirely distinct species. However, it's possible that they were all Homo sapiens and that our species was formerly far more varied than it is today. According to Eleanor Sari, an archaeologist at the University of Oxford, if you look at skulls, you'll see different features of modern humans arising in different locations at different times. She explains that this is because we're a species with multiple African origins. She and others contend that many populations that existed all over Africa are where humans first appeared. Geographical barriers kept them apart, so they primarily evolved in isolation. Each group acquired some of our defining characteristics, but not others. However, their distance wasn't constant. Those early humans were constantly pushed together and wrenched away as a shifting climate altered the African environment, greening deserts and drying out forests. Every time they came into contact, they mated and mixed, sharing DNA and concepts in a melting pot that spread over the continent, finally coalescing into the complete array of traits that you or I may recognize. This hypothesis, called African multi-regionalism, offers a very different explanation for how humanity came to be. It is stating that we were not created by a particular region or population. It asserts that all of Africa served as the cradle of humankind. 22 anthropologists, archaeologists, geneticists, and climatologists gathered with Sherry to discuss the evidence supporting African multi-regionalism. In a paper that is published, their discussions are detailed, and co-author Mark Thomas portrays the work as a call to arms. We're arguing that it's incredibly unlikely that people formed in one place before dispersing over the globe, he continues. Our ancestry will have spread throughout much of Africa because we're so used to thinking about ancestry in terms of trees, whether it's a family tree that links members of a clan or an evolutionary tree that shows the ties between species, it might be difficult to understand this concept. Trees have solitary trunks that branch off into tidy divisions. They cause us to think more about singular origins. Even if there is evidence that humans first appeared in Africa 300,000 years ago, we must have started elsewhere. The proponents of African multi-regionalism disagree. They contend that Homo sapiens descended from an ancestor that had already divided into numerous discrete communities and was scattered over Africa. These groups, which occasionally mated with one another and possibly with other contemporary hominids like Homo naledi, are where we evolved. Homo naledi was an odd hybrid of prehistoric characteristics, such as a small brain and contemporary characteristics like large legs. They came to the conclusion that it was a skilled climber, a long-distance walker, and possibly a toolmaker. No tree serves as the finest analogy for this. A group of streams that are all a part of the same system but that weave in and out of one another is referred to as a braided river. Eventually, these streams will combine into a single, large channel, but it will take hundreds of thousands of years. Any one group of Homo sapiens only possessed a portion of the constellation of traits we use to identify ourselves over the majority of our history. People back then looked more different to each other than any populations do today, says Sherry, and it's very hard to answer what early Homo sapiens looked like, but there was then a continent-wide trend to the modern human form. In fact, the first people who had the complete set probably appeared between 40,000 and 100,000 years ago. Hominids made the same type of large stone hand axes from one millennium to the next for a few million years, but that technological stagnation ended around 300,000 years ago, the same age as the earliest Homo sapiens fossils, and archaeologists have discovered new types of specialized and sophisticated stone tools, like awls and spear tips, from that time period. These tools from the so-called Middle Stone Age suggest that the modern human mind and body underwent a transition at a continental level because they have been discovered at three different locations, each with regional variations, Jebel Irhud in Morocco, Olor Gesele in Kenya, and Florisbad in South Africa. The African multi-regionalism hypothesis has one major potential flaw. 
Genetic studies of contemporary African populations suggest that they diverged between 100,000 and 150,000 years ago, much later than the early continent-wide origin suggested by the bones and tools. That deep and broad origin might be true, but it's not something that we geneticists have formally tested, says Brenna Hen from UC Davis, an author on the new paper. The studies that analyzed this modern DNA have largely relied on tree-like population models in which a single lineage grows from a single place, exactly the scenario that proponents of African multi-regionalism say is incorrect. However, the DNA of today's Africans has been shaped by more recent population upheavals that have obscured the events of 300,000 years ago. We need more data from many of the gaps across Africa if we are to understand what happened, and we are just beginning to find out how to refine this new theory. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.